another two hours to the uh, the, the course. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't get your question. Did you find the course useful? The two yes, hours of course, of course. Of course. Uh, I've been like reading the classroom for the past uh, few years now, so uh, so many things. Uh, yeah, makes sense to me. I, I I I did tell you that even during my PhD, I was actually referring to your work. I know reading your materials, and you know I was active on, on Facebook, you know following your page closely to get input. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, I found all the materials useful, and I'll be sharing them later with my participants. To, uh, you know during the, the 3 p.m. slot. Uh, so you know so that you know because uh, participants for today they would be following this session, the 9 a.m. one. Communicative English. The other lecturer is going to uh, share how she's applying it uh, for her religious uh, studies class. So at least, you know, the participants will be able to see how it's done, you know, in the real context. And we're not just saying, but these are people that have these their lessons um, according to, you know, the flip concept. Uh, following the, the various principles of instructions and cognitive apprenticeship. So at least, you know, I have real examples. I, You know, there's no use of me just, okay, this is the model, this is the framework. But, you know, I want real people sharing their real stories. And I think that's something that, you know, they, the participants would appreciate because it's something, you know, meaning that makes it more meaningful. You know, it's like, she's just one of us and, and if she can do it, you know, with these limited resources, no, I should. You know, I, I think one of the reasons why we come up with this webinar is to inspire the lecturers, you know. Uh, I, I know so many of them are doing amazing. I also would like to, you know, give them a platform for them to share. Um, yeah, so we have this the webinar will be going on for three so we have another, um, yesterday we completed three webinars, so yours is the fourth. So we have all together 39. So we have three down and 36 more. Yeah. So we have actually put in five teams. Uh, the first will be how to work with LMS. Uh, second theme is uh, how to use a communication platform together with your LMS uh, to design your lessons. Uh, and also using live teaching. Uh, so there are the apps to use live teaching and how you conduct your lessons through that. The third thing would be content creation. How do you create your own videos? How do you create interactive materials using Edpuzzle? Uh, how do you use Flipgrid? How do you use VoiceThread? So these are actually things that I usually um, share during my workshops. But this time, you know, I'm getting others to actually share it and, and pitch in and, you know, give, give, give real examples of how they are doing it in class. You know, that's how we get the community building. And... The fourth team would be um, wait, uh, content creations. The third, the fourth team would be yes, um, your well-being. How to actually, um, you know, how to maintain your well-being during this pandemic? You know, and you have to do fully online. You know, you're not used to how you as a lecturer. How do you, you know, manage your time well? Yeah. So we have um, interesting topics. Um, some are in English, some are in Malay. So, but I don't mind sharing you the, the. I mean, you can see on my Facebook. I'll be, I'll be um, sharing the posters with you. Okay. So we have about yeah. two more minutes. Um, yeah. Okay. Not much of chat yet. Everybody, everybody's still quiet. Let's do some housekeeping. So John, are you ready? I am ready. Okay. Another minute. We'll start. So I'll introduce you. I'll introduce you a bit. Okay. Do a bit of housekeeping. Yeah. And we'll start.
Okay, I'm good morning everyone. Uh, good evening, John. Since he's 13 hours behind, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Dr. Umavadi Murthy, and I'm the Senior Assistant Director at Instructional and Digital Learning Division, Department of Polytechnic and Community Education, under the purview of the Ministry of Higher Education of Malaysia. Now, billions of learners uh, are enrolled in online courses around the world, yet we do not know if these students are engaged in their courses, nor do we understand what may keep them engaged in such courses. And in these times, uh, with the current pandemic, face-to-face -face educational functions and activities are being moved online using remote working sites and tools. Now, many of us are struggling with the adjustment to working and teaching online, especially those who have always taught in a traditional classroom and are being asked to rapidly regroup and prepare for a longer period of educational social distancing. Now, where do you begin? How do you manage the process? How do you do stuff? Now, to address these questions, we are presenting how to make teaching work effective lesson planning, specifically planning a flipped online class. And together I have here Jonathan Bergman, or I'll call him John, um, a flipped learning evangelist and change agent. Okay, so John Bergman is considered a pioneer in the flipped classroom movement. John is leading the global flipped learning movement by working with governments, schools, corporations and schools. He has worked literally all over the world. Well, how is this the first time? Something to do with Malaysia. And is the author of seven books including a best-selling book, Flip Your Classroom, which has been translated into 10 languages. He's the founder of the Global FlipCon Conferences, which are dynamic, engaging events which inspire educators to transform their practice through flipped learning. John is also the host of the flip side, a radio show which airs on the BAM radio network and most episodes are 5 and 7 minutes long and often John has guests where they discuss flip learning and other times John simply shares his thoughts on education that he has learned over the years as a teacher and an educator. Now without further ado, we will turn the time over to John, presenter for today. With you, John. Thank you yeah, thanks, thanks, Uma, for having me. And thanks for this. Is my first time to really speak in Malaysia, and I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us. It's it's, a, it's my honor to be. And I know that this transition to online learning for all of us has been hard. Uh, many of you may know or not know, but I, uh, you know, I, I, for the last eight years, I was traveling the world, uh, teaching people how to flip their classroom and visited many, many places. Uh, but this past year, I felt that I needed back to practice what I've been preaching, and so now I am lucky. And I taught this year, for my first time in eight years, in the classroom, working with students, uh, year 11 and year 12 students, physics and geology, and uh, through the pandemic, like you did. Now, the first thing I want to say is it was hard. It was really hard. And, oh, I, you know, I, I, I walked in, I walked in thinking, oh, I like this. I help pioneer flip learning. This should be easy. And let me say this, it wasn't easy for me. Now, I did talk to my colleagues who you know, did not have a background in flip learning, and frankly, it was even harder for them. Um, yeah. So I think I had it easy, but it was So I want to just say that to everybody. It's okay that this is hard. So yeah, this to get message that. to you. This, this is something we have to figure out how to do Together. So that said, let me uh, share my. But I, I've got a few thoughts that I've gleaned, and it's just not my own thoughts. We're going to talk about how do we plan for a flip classroom. So first of all, I'd like you to do is to pull out your device and go to menti.com and use the code that's there nine seven eight eight nine nine. And I just what what was your challenge? To, uh, to, to do this. You understand the concept. So, go, so just on a browser, you know, if you're on your phone, go to your browser, and then just go to menti.com. You go there too. And you're going to the nine seven eight eight nine nine. Okay. 
So you'll be able to see the question from John, what has been your biggest struggle with things since COVID? So participants, please share. Activity, time management, engagement, engagement, inferior. I wonder what that means. Internet access. Uh, you don't have the equipment to teach online. Students cheating in assessment. I had that problem. I get that. that that's a little <laughs> issue. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I, I came up with a solution that was sort of okay. So, but I'm seeing a pattern here. A lot of students with internet access in Malaysia, infrastructure issues, slow internet, yeah. not knowing how to use the platform, I think you should have that. Um, not knowing how to use the platform and suitable internet activities, unable to connect to your online, lack of courage or courage. This, this, this uh, issue of connectivity, we're seeing that same problem in a lot of schools here in the States in our lower socioeconomic issues. This is a, this is a big issue. Uh, yeah. It's not easy to answer. So you know, my presentation will be making an assumption that you've got that. I know that's not the case. There are other ways we could talk about that. Um, yeah. yeah, getting them engaged, though, in an online class, <laughs> Great. Uh, to adapt to teaching apps and technology. Yeah. Awesome. Well, keep. I'm gonna. You can come back to these later. So if you want to keep up putting in your responses, these are great responses. Let me talk briefly about what learning is, and you'll see the connection to online. Right? So this is the definition uh, developed by the Academy of Active Learning Arts and Sciences. By the way, this was done by 100 people in 40 countries. So this is not a definition that I came up with. It was uh, crowdsourced by experts. Uh, I helped chair this with a uh, Harvard professor and a Stanford professor, professor from the first Flip University in the world in Istanbul, uh, a number of different people who were on the committee, uh, experts from Spain, Taiwan, and people from all over the world. And this is important to understand that flipped learning is a framework that enables it to reach every student. I think what happened in the previous definitions of flipped learning is we talked too much about, about the purpose. And the purpose for us to reach every student. And I know that those of you who are listening here, I do believe in reaching your students. But of course, then the, the basic concept is that it inverts the traditional classroom by okay. introducing the course concepts for class. Okay. But then it allows the educator, that's you and me, to use class time to guide each student. So here's keywords active, practical, innovative applications. And, and the way to think about that is, well, let me kind of go for it. This same group also came up with the flipped learning standard at that same website, aalasinternational.org. Um, we came up with the global standards. And it turns out that we found there's 186 standards. But of those 186, we categorized them into 12 categories that you can see right there. And it takes the form of, it looks like, uh, you know, chemistry, periodic data. These are the individual elements of an effective flipped classroom, whether it's done online or whether it's done face-to-face. -face. And what we're talking about today, ultimately, is one of the categories of this. So one of the categories, one of those 12 categories, is planning or flipped learning. If you don't plan well, whether you're planning for an online system or you're planning for a face-to-face -face system, it's not going to go well for you. There are, I can set count on it, maybe a dozen specific things that the experts, and this is based on the research on flip learning, this is not something that was concocted out of the head, just concocted out of 100 people in 49 countries who are experts in flip learning, came up with these dozen or so things. But let me, let me show the images that might makes makes it all sort of make sense. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the concept of Bloom's taxonomy, or the framework yes. of Bloom's taxonomy. And in Bloom's taxonomy, what happens in most classrooms, and by the way, used to 
happened in my club when I was a stand and deliver teacher for 19 years, not in the traditional way. And in those, in those 19 years, I spent most of my class time doing remembering and understanding things. I stood up and taught my students stuff. And then they had to go home and apply and analyze and evaluate and, and create. I, I think that, that even occurred to me. So when I was in school, we had to do, we always wondered, why was it easy when, uh, why was the, you know, the exercise easy when the teacher was present? But when we got home, we doing the, the, the activities, the tasks, we found it, this is the hard stuff. And I don't get to do it in class. I get to do the easy stuff in class. But when I come home, I get to do the homework, which is hard. Yeah, so in, in 2007, when myself and Aaron Sams were thinking about this, we realized what we really wanted to do on six. So what we wanted to do in less class time on remembering and understanding, and more class time on the hard stuff. And that was our big aha. And then later on, we realized that actually we think the actual correct shape of Bloom's taxonomy should be the time. I think it's unrealistic spend the bulk of your class time at the creation and evaluation level. Um, unless you're getting a PhD, I could actually see the inverted diamond in a PhD program, but in a, uh, a uh, secondary or tertiary program in polytechnics or community colleges that you guys are with, that I would encourage, you, you want to spend your time, class time, applying, analyzing, some time evaluating, and maybe some time creating. It's just you want to spend the bulk of your time in the middle of it. So, one more question for you guys. So pull out your devices. To what extent have you flipped your class? Or just multiple choice. Never, just a little since COVID. Some or a lot. Same code. If you're back on your browser, it'll just automatically pop this. So. Never, thank you. COVID folks. Yeah, I'm going too fast. 
the idea is really quite simple. Do the hard stuff and the independent time. I mean, pardon me, do the easy stuff during the independent time. Do the hard stuff during the group time. Now, the group time can be done. The cognitive load, right, is kind of get a little... Students struggle with hard things. And where do they need the help? They need the help when you're present. You. The most valuable thing in a flipped classroom is you. The teacher, the instructor, the professor. That's, they, they need your help when they're struggling with the hard stuff. The idea, have them do the easy stuff by themselves. Before. Yeah. Yeah, before. All right. Uh, the questions are flying, so if, can you figure out what the next question I should answer? I'm losing track here. Okay. So, uh, does the flip classroom work for practical, you know, for the hands-on part, the hands-on component? So, I mean, the beauty of a flip classroom is that you can have much more hands-on activities. Now, what I'm talking about is a reference primarily, though, to if you can have face-to-face -face contact, but you can do if you will, hands-on kinds of things in an online setting. It's not as easy, it's more difficult. Okay. Engineering professor, are there open simulations that you can do? Yes. Are there, uh, are there experiments that your students can do with simple things they could find laying around their house? So as a physics instructor uh, for year 11s and 12s here in the States, I had my students doing physics experiments at home uh, with simple things. I asked myself to see if I had these little things at home. We were studying pendulums, and I had them design pendulum. Students had pendulums with um, rocks, with uh, wine bottles, with whatever they could find in a street. They found some way to build a pendulum and study the motion of a pendulum. Uh, I said, get creative. Uh, yeah, uh, Rezal then Sonia, that's a great question. You're asking how can problem-based learning be implemented using the classroom? You know, well, the thing that we've discovered about flipped learning is that it not, it, it's actually a meta strategy as opposed to being a, uh, just another strategy. It's not like, so I had a relation a year ago when I'm at a conference in Spain, and a lot of people think there's blended learning, there's flipped learning, there's problem-based learning, there's project-based learning, there's this kind of learning, there's cooperative learning, there's mastery learning, uh, etc. What we've discovered is that what is that flip learning is that flip learning is a strategy that supports and the best for was development. A professor here in the US, Dr. Robert Talbert, he said flip learning is like the operating system. So you know my phone, or my phone is, here's my cell phone. So my cell phone here has iOS as its operating system. But I use many apps on the phone, right? I have many apps that I use. A weather app, a news app, and I've got different apps that I use. And what, what Dr. Talbert said that really resonated with me, he says, flip learning is the operating system for education. And you plug in different apps, okay, like project-based learning, like problem-based learning, like peer instruction, et cetera, et cetera, is flip learning allows that to happen? Uh, yeah. Because you have more time. Keep going. Good. It gives you the time to do those interesting things. Uh, yeah. Dr. Rick Mazur at university, who's become a friend, he's a physics professor there. He's a big believer in pure instruction, but he could not do it without flipping because they have to have something to do ahead of time so that when they yeah. come to class, can participate in peer instruction, or in your case, problem-based. Great question. Yeah. Uh, so are they covering that problem-based, uh, I mean, uh, structuring your instruction for problem-based, are they covering that later at 3 p.m. during uh, the 3 p.m. webinar? Mm -hmm. okay. You might as well have flipped classroom for student English proficiency as low, of course. Of course, of course. <laughs> so we will be introducing... Yeah, yeah, correct. So we'll have a few uh, okay participants at 3 p.m. Uh, we will show you, uh, we will have uh, lecturers from Quran Ibrahim Sultan who will be sharing how they have flipped their English lessons uh, to teach resume and the, uh, the, the activities, the interesting activities that they have for their students. Yeah, yeah. Even Actually, if you're from English, you're able to. If you're a teacher of English, teacher of, 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 of a second language, and English being the most common language taught around the world, uh, that is 
probably one of the most flipped courses I've seen around the world. Yeah. It's, totally. It's like done, it's like the most like. So let me jump now back to my, my PowerPoint. And let's talk about, how do you plan to flip an online right? This is a tricky question. And myself and Dan Jones, Dan Jones, a teacher here in the United States, came up with this just recently. And I think this is the way to really think through what's going on, particularly in our COVID world. So yes. we've got a lot of options with us, right? So we could have, we could have a class that's fully synchronous right here, right? That, that might be just a regular classroom, right? So if you had a regular classroom and you're right here, that means you get all your time with your students at the same time. But again, okay. John, may I interrupt? John, yes. may I interrupt? Um, can you explain to us uh, and to uh, to the participants what do you mean by 100% synchronous? What do you mean by 50%? What do you mean by asynchronous 100%? Can you explain to us that first? So synchronous would mean that you have 100% uh, of your time with your students. There is, so uh, all the time they have in class is with you. So face-to-face -face or even online. You, well, that's very rare. If it's completely asynchronous, then everything is done online, but you never meet together at the same time. Like in a WebEx room like we're in right now, or a Zoom room, or whatever platform you're using. You may have, though, a 50% where you see half your, your students or 50 is not very well. Uh, 50% where you'll have some of your students in like a synchronous classroom, which could be face-to-face -face in a school, or it could be online in a Zoom or a WebEx, right? And, and the point of this is that, is that we want to think about two different spaces. If you, we've got orange, the independent space where the student is working alone, and then blue, the group space where the student is working in a synchronous environment. And so the question that you need to deal with, this is, this is like the most important lesson I can give you today, is the more that you are to the left of this graph, you're over here, meaning mm -hmm. you have very little time where you are in the same space at the same time, meaning you are not in a Zoom room together. To that degree, you have to provide more and very specific supports for students for the higher cognitive tests. And hopefully you see that we've got the Broom's taxonomy of verbs going up, right? So if you were to take my classroom that I teach today, or we just finished for the school year just last week, but if you, you would see my class would probably exist at about this spot, right? Where in, I was able to get most of these are pre-COVID moments here. I was able to the hard stuff with my students in class face to face. And I provided the support standing next to my students. And but they still had to do the independent stuff at home by themselves when they were home. Okay. But yeah. then when COVID hit, it was more like here. I had to exist here because I did have some synchronous time. I was able to meet with my students. Um, about two and a half hours a week, each of my classes, in a mm -hmm. Zoom room. And so I was able to, I, and so I very carefully planned my lessons. So I spent most of my Zoom time only at the higher orders of loans. They had mm -hmm. to do the easy stuff on their own. Independently, okay. So I have a question. Um, yeah. So uh, did you put them in breakout rooms for them to work in their spaces? Absolutely, yes. Oh, well, not all the time. Uh, it, depended, uh, it depended on the lesson, but that was a very common strategy to use break, of course. So it depended. I'll talk about the specifics of what that might look like in a minute. Okay. But this, this is a framework that helps you figure this out. And like this, this right here, it's not a very junk drawing, but this axis, of course, is the degree of support you have to provide. So one thing that I learned, I've created an online course, I'll share with you in a minute, an online course on how to do this well. And I was talking with a, a, uh, an instructor in um, Australia. And one thing that he provides, because he, he, he's an online instructor, so he, he doesn't teach face-to-face, -face. he's an online instructor, so this is what his job is. 
and he sees his students for one hour a week in a WebEx room. And so he provides very specific supports here for the harder things. So maybe he's like here on the ground, right? And so he has this one hour a week, and he really says that, oh, it's so valuable. But that hour, he's got to make it super valuable when he's face-to-face -face with his students in his WebEx room. And what he does is he has to provide different supports when they're in the independent space to do the hard stuff. So he, for example, will embed a video inside of the and So he's a math instructor. And so what he'll do is that, for example, when the students are doing a math assignment, they've got it online. What they do is when they get, he's actually built into the actual assignment a little button. They click on the button, and it's his voice saying, hey, guys, uh, I bet you're struggling on this problem. Let me explain to you a couple of hints to help you. Because don't, don't worry, it's, it's a hard problem. I knew you'd struggle with it. But let me give you a few hints. And so he provides some help in the independent space where they, when they get stuck. So they don't have to just rely on him uh, talking because they won't be with him. He only has an hour a week for this to Make sense? So, yes, of course. So that means he acts as a virtual assistant and he actually has, with his extensive experience of teaching, he actually has a bank of questions or he has a bank of the common misconceptions that students actually have. Uh, when they're doing that certain topic and he has actually hashed in on those things. That means, I think this thing that participants are, you all, you all know your stuff. So, um, try to embed like audio clips. I've read uh, of, the, of uh, some educators embedding audio clips into worksheets. Just like what you mentioned just now um, on um, guy. Uh, okay, guys, I think this is something that you guys need to remember, this tip here. And, you know, it makes it easier for the student to work independently. And an asynchronous uh, session. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. So let me give you six do's, if you will. Six things I would encourage you to do as you're planning your lesson. Right. Okay. And the first one is similar to what we've already talked about. You need to determine how much time that you have face to face with your student. Now, what I mean by face to face, I mean probably in a COVID world, in some kind of a of a synchronous WebEx, Zoom, whatever meeting. So you have, where do you fit on this continuum? And you are, you know, if you can hardly have any connectivity, then maybe you are in a completely asynchronous class, and you've got to provide the supports for everything. But if you have some face-to-face -face time, again, that can happen in a Zoom room, you might be here. And you need to figure out what supports you need to provide your students. The less time you have face to face, the more you have to provide supports in the independent space. Uh -huh. Makes sense. Yes. That's tip number one. Tip number two. This is probably it's sort of a, you need to ask yourself the most important question. The most important question is this: What is the best use of your face to face last time? Now, when I say face to face. That could be in a WebEx room. Okay. What are you going to do? Hopefully, you realize uh, that it's not you teaching them new stuff. I just had a conversation yesterday with Dr. Robert Turner, the guy who talked about the operating system. We had a wonderful conversation yesterday, and basically, he said one thing the pandemic has, I'm going to sort of summarize his quote, one thing that the pandemic has shown us and has shown students is there's no, no lecture, is, at least when you're face to face with uh, Hear me carefully. Um, that's John saying, stupid. Robert did say But no one's defending lecture because we need to not lecture to our students when we are. Now, hear me carefully. I believe in lecturing to my students. I'm in my room right now, in my, uh, my studio, as we stand. I, I lecture to my students, but I pre-record my, my lectures. I do it in this room at my mm -hmm. library. This is where I record my sessions here in my studio, in this room, in this space. And I have physics videos, I have geology videos, chemistry videos. And they can watch these. So that's the stuff. So that when I'm face-to-face -face with them, 
that's where the magic happens. And that magic happened in my Zoom room when I was with them these last three or four months. It's forever. It's just forever. All right? So that's tip number two. Tip number three is have clear expectations. But especially if you're online, you have to be very, very clear about what you expect your kids to do, both in the independent space and the group space. And by the way, I utterly failed at this when I first started doing online. This was one of my big mistakes, is I was not so clear, and my students were students, and I blew it. So this is something you've got to be super clear. So what do you want them to do in the independent space? Very clear. What do you want to have? What do you want to happen in that group space? That is a huge mistake I made, and I bet many of you probably did too. <laughs> when you got thrust into online education. So, anyways, Uma, thoughts on that? Um, I think maybe it, uh, we can start with like an orientation towards the whole flip concept. Um, so that students actually know what are the do's and the don'ts, how many assignments they need to complete, uh, by when they will need to complete the assignment. So if it's uh, it's it's like um, you know clearly articulated, so they can actually keep track of what they're expected to do. I think that's what. If I were to do it, I would actually start with an orientation session uh, you know, for me to uh, share my expected students and have a discussion, and then you know we need we get a consensus on. Uh, how do we agree, like, you know, after how many days do I submit this task, is it okay for me to do it, uh, let's say I want them to do a reflective piece, then they might ask me, instead of writing it down, can I just write it, you know, is it okay if I were to do a video instead of writing, you know, so these are the things that need to be between the, 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 the lecturer and the, and the student, yeah. Thank you, John, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the next one, I've lost track of this, is three or four, uh, plan using backward design. That uh, means that you start with the end in mind. What is your biggest goal? What do you want your students to learn? You have to ask that question. And then in this particular lesson, right? Today, my lesson, I'm teaching about pendular motion. Physics. All right. What do I want? That's a pendulum thing that goes back and forth. Uh, what is the key things I want them to learn? Write those down. Then once you know that, the question begins, what's the best way for them to learn that? Well, in my case, the case of pendular motion, I didn't want them to watch my video first because my video talked about what causes a pendular motion. I said, I don't want you to do that first. I want you to get a string and a weight, and I want you to answer three questions. What affects how long it takes for the pendulum to go back and forth? And I want you to measure the, the weight of, the, of the, the thing at the end of the string, the length of the string, and how far you pull it back. And when I got back into that Zoom room that next day, I said, I don't want you to watch the video. Don't watch the video. Mm -hmm. um, they so came up with the keep the end in the mind. Yes, because I wanted them to discover that for themselves mm -hmm. and be sort of awed. I could, I could have just lectured and said it only depends on the length of the string, which is, by the way, mm -hmm. it And also the planet that you're standing on, but since we're all on the planet Earth, yeah. that didn't apply. If it was on the moon, mm -hmm. it would be different. But... Yeah. Uh, that was powerful for them, for them to discover the answer to that question. So I had to yeah. think that through. But the independent mm -hmm. space, well, what I've done if I had them in class, so we would have gotten out weights, done an experiment in class. But since we're in a COVID world, I said, figure this out. You're creative young people, and they made it happen. They shot videos of it, and uh, just part of the requirement. Again, being clear, I was clear. I want you to shoot a video, upload it to Flip. Talk about Flipland or our conversation, and I want you to show me what you did. It was just two points. Yeah. So start with the end. I think creating is something natural to them these days because you know this app uh, makes it simple. You know, just a few, and the learning curve is not so high. So I think they, they tend to like the idea of you know, being able to make something. I think they are makers inside. They are makers, and they Everybody strive wants to, to make. be a YouTube star to some degree anymore, right? Yes. Actually, my final project in my geology class, I did this for both the first term semester and then the second semester, is I said, your goal is to make a flip video better than mine, and I will use yours next year for class. It's yeah, yeah. Yeah, and talking about reusing and repurposing. Yeah. 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 Oh. All right, so next tip. I guess we have two more tips. Be what, four or five? Plan using Bloom's taxonomy. Yeah. Here's the, here's the filter, people. 
If it's remembering or understanding, it's the independence of it. Yes. If it's applying, analyzing, evaluating, creating, it's the groups. Now, in a COVID world, right, and if you have less and less time, you may have to do remembering, understanding, applying, and some analyzing in the independence. So it may be different depending on how much group space you That's going to vary depending on what model you are in in terms of how much differentness versus asynchronous time that you have. That answer is going to change depending upon you know, what model you're going to be under. Who knows what models we'll be under when we go back to school um, in uh, you know, a couple of months here in the States. And then lastly, oh, I don't have the one up there, but you should have a logical flow. Uh, you should have a flow to your lesson. So that it, a sort of expectation. So I want to share with you a flow, a logical flow. So here is a Zoom room in one of my classes. There I am right there with one of my, my classes. It's not all of them, but it's a number of the pictures that I took. I grabbed a screenshot of my kiddos in my Zoom room. And here is what I would say would be actually do if you have a synchronous time with your students, here is what I would recommend that you do. The first thing I would recommend that you do is you check in with them. Mm -hmm. I would really, really encourage them. And I had a question every day. If every student had to you know, turn their microphone on, and they would have to say, answer the question. It might be, what's your favorite animal? Or it, as, the, as, the, as we got deeper and deeper into the COVID, the questions actually got deeper. You know, what's on your bucket list? What's a childhood memory? Asked interesting questions. And that took five or six minutes to go around to each student. But you know what? What makes good teaching good? Oh, no. And it's the heart of flip learning. Is it's about relationships and connections. So if yeah. we are checking in with their social emotional needs, then we're not uh, teaching well. So, and I also read that, you know, when you check in with your students, especially during the pandemic, it actually, this is dopamine. Uh, release because you know they feel well, someone's actually concerned about them. You know, it, it, it might it's just a little thing, but for them it might mean some. You know, someone's actually checking on. Yeah, thank you for the tip. Because I would encourage you as you're checking in on them. You, if you note the students who are not doing well, from your perspective, then reach out to them. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw one particular young lady who was uh, extreme extrovert mm -hmm. and. The coping being stuck in her home for day after day after day by herself or just, you know, with her, her family. She was wilting away. Yeah. So I had to check in on her. I said, how are you doing? I can see her. So, I have a main session. Now, what could the main session be? There's so many ways to do good active learning in a Zoom room. You could do peer instruction. You could have a group conversation. You could, uh, in, my, in my physics classes, we do breakout rooms to work on physics problems. It's okay to just work on physics problems, and I would watch them work on their physics problems. I had a really good software tool that I used where I was able to sort of look over all their shoulders all the time, and I could check their work and make comments and see if they were making mistakes when they were sort of mathy type physics problems or whatever. Uh, another thing I would encourage you, this is something I didn't do, but I learned as I was interviewing a bunch of experts, which I'll talk about in the next slide. I was interviewing some experts, and I realized that something that is good about online learning is you should have them in the middle of your session stop and have a brain break. Step up, run in place, maybe you do a little another check-in and you just you stop talking about physics or engineering or uh, cosmetology or whatever it is you're teaching them. Have them take a break and just because the brain needs to reset. And then um, you do a main set again, another main session. So you, you kind of have to plan for two different activities. It could be a continuation of the first depending on how much time you Again, remember, the filter is blooms. What are the hard things you're trying to accomplish? And then you need to remind them of what they need to do. They are students. Hey, poet, in the independent space tonight, or before our next meeting, or whatever it might be, here are the tasks that you need to accomplish. Yeah. This and that. If you don't do that, they won't do it. Yeah, they won't do it. Yeah. And so then you, make make the, you, know, the, you plan for your closure, right? Yeah. And then the, maybe the best thing I did this year as a teacher, frankly, was the sixth step. I started this in January, and I said, I I did some work on a, an online course that I've, I've developed, and one thing that I was sort of like, 
felt I really needed to do is bring in reflection. So I had all of my students create a Google, Google document. Okay. And at the end of every class period, I'd, I actually set my alarm on my phone. And it would ring five minutes before class ended. And I'd say, reflect time. Stop what you're doing and reflect on what you learned. And there were two questions and then reflect on. Number one, what did you do in the independent space for the next class? So they sort of was like a good reminder for them. And secondly, what did you learn today? Okay. But this was then shared me and them. And so I would, at the end of every week, check in on their Google Doc and reflect with them. And you can make comments. I don't know if you guys use Google Docs at all, but I've become a huge fan. Um, I would make comments on their reflections. And when COVID happened, you know, March 15th or whatever, everything blew up here. Um, guess what we did? We having reflections. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So at the, the end of every class, actually I had them do this. I said, all right, we are now approaching the class. I want you to reflect. And then when you're done, I want you to put your mic on. And then I, I relationship, I would like you to say, um, Something like, I'm my reflection, Mr. Bergman, and I'm ready to move on. And I would just say, well, it was wonderful having you in class today, Kath. Just call them by name. His relationships really matter. So, uh -huh. let me share one other thing that I forgot to put in the slide deck that I think might be useful. Uh, something I did, maybe the best thing I did in the COVID thing, was at the end of. I was sort of feeling, especially for my, my year 12 students. So year 12 students graduate, and you know, I won't see them again, right? And I didn't get a chance to say goodbye. Aww. And for them, I realized that I needed to find a way to say goodbye. And I then did it for all my students. What I did is I created a short video for every student, where I just looked, I'm sitting in this room, that I stand in right now, and I looked into the camera, and I said, hey, cat. I sure loved having you in this year. And I just had a personal message, two minutes, three minutes, to every student. It took me a few hours. And then I sent that to them uh, via email. And uh, I had students in tears. I had parents yeah. and students in tears. You can do this to get them in tears. It's just I needed a way to say goodbye to them and also tell them that they mattered. And I tell you, Good teaching has always been about relationships, and you can make relationships happen, positive relationships, even in an online setting. So I would really, really encourage you to think of ways, creative ways to make relationships with your students. And uh, I also want to encourage you at all, so sort of thing, and then we'll do some Q&A, is I have created, or it's not just I, my team and I have created some online courses to teach you how to flip well. They are into 12 hours of being with me and other experts. Uh, like you can see if you're higher education down here, there's 25 higher ed ed experts and they're going to add some more. I'm not here in the next few days. Uh, uh, we're going to add some experts and we've got an entire section on how to do online learning well. It's a two hour portion of our course. How to really flip well based upon the global standards that we talked about. And this is the link that you can go to. I would encourage, I mean, if you're an administrator right at some of the community colleges, the Polytechnics, contact us and see if we can arrange some way to get our professors, your instructors um, trained. I know there's costs and beyond, but we can make some arrangements. Because I really, we really want to see this happen on a large scale because we're trying to just help people. Yeah, so, so you were trying to come lesson planning specialist in 2018 uh, from FLG Global. So I would highly recommend, yeah, highly recommend uh, other lecturers who are listening to um, yeah. to, to uh, complete the certification courses. Yeah. So I have uh, two more pending. Yeah, I'll be doing that. But I've done the, the link right here and share that out. Maybe you can type the link in the chat bar for them if they want to find that. Yeah. I'll type lastly, it. I just that's really all I have. Uh, I'm glad to stick around. Because there's many questions as you want. So what are some all of your right. questions? So thank you uh, for sharing. So I would, uh, uh, please, uh, I think your most pressing questions. All right. So thank you so much for the tips. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we'll be sharing uh, during our third session. Uh,
on how to actually organize your lessons uh, based on the tips from uh, John himself and also uh, based on some theoretical uh, frameworks uh, that Associate Professor Dr. Dorothy has shared yesterday. You know, so um, I'm glad that, you know, the speakers that we have had, they're all, uh, you know, the same um, mindset, you know, on, on, on uh, becoming a passionate educator. You can't wing an online class. You have to go in planned. Uh, you have to really plan your stuff. You just can't wing it, like in a face-to-face -face class. So I think that's another important uh, um, also, uh, let's just look at any other questions. Uh, I think uh, the independent and the group space, you know, because now we have online classes. So how do we uh, uh, distribute the independent section like how many hours? Maybe sometimes they would ask you, I think a famous thing in their mind would be, okay, if I have a three-hour face-to-face pre-COVID session, now how do I break it down into... Which one goes, uh, how many hours is independent? How many hours is group speed? I think there's no numbers to it, John. What do you think? I mean, it depends. It's going to be the structure of the you design your school, right? I mean, every school is going to have a different answer. I'd love to have my students for five hours a week, which I used to have, but I'm not going to get that this year, I bet. I think because if I just in my own classroom, and if you practice social distancing, I can't have as many students that used to be in my classroom in my We're going to have to come up with some other system next year. And there's many, many ideas floating out there, but who knows what they're going to look like. Now, honestly, I think what's happening, at least in the U.S., is we're watching what's happening in Australia and Argentina and places that are still in session to see what they find. And then we're going to figure it out, you know, sometime in August when we start school. But who knows what it's going to look like when it comes to the fall. Yeah, it's, it's, We've uh, got to figure this out. Yeah, we've got to figure this out, yeah. So, well, there's, and there's so many ways. It could be A or B or C. Um, JC, I, I think I, I have some ideas on how to tackle students from rural. So the biggest instance of flip learning right now in the world is actually in Argentina. And it's in a, in a rural province in Argentina that is uh, by and large very poor. And they have been flipping... Uh, their K-12 schools now for, uh, they, they're, they were on a five-year plan to change, to go completely flipped. That was about two years ago. So this is year three. I have a feeling they've had to accelerate that since. But, but here's an interesting thing that they've done as of low tech. I met a, 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 a secondary teacher there. And what he was doing is, one thing the students have is they have a cell phone. And so they designed systems that worked along a cell phone. So for his lowest tech students, what he did is he created an audio file, just an MP3 file, and then sent them Bluetooth. The students didn't have internet at all, or had very limited, uh, they couldn't download much from the internet because of uh, their plan. And he Bluetoothed them a PDF, and then he would Bluetooth them an MP3. He would say, turn to page or scroll to page four of the PDF, and then he would talk over it. And what he found is that he used very, very little um, rate on their phones, because many of their phones were very low quality. They didn't have an iPhone like I do. They had a, a, a lower-end Android phone, which is all they could afford. It was a rural poor area. And he was able, he was an English teacher. Somebody asked about English. He taught English to his students. He was teaching them English, and he would say, turn to page three. He would talk through different things on page three, and then page four, and he would have different little um, MP3 files, which are just, you know, audio files. But he sort of was making a video, if you think about it, right? Because he was having them look at something, a PDF, of the things he was talking about. Maybe he was talking about speaking, you know, particles, you know, whatever different parts of speech when he's teaching students how to speak. So, yeah, that might help you. We have another question. How can I stay engaged with the student? This is from Jean from Tambunan Community College, which is in Borneo. Now, how can I stay engaged with my students after checking in? What if the session becomes unresponsive? How to tackle that? Well, that sometimes happened to me, so I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Some kids checked out, and then I think the key is to check back with that individual. So 
I would send emails or texts. I did texts. There's a program called Remind that allows you to students on your seat if you're not students across the world. It's just awesome. Remind. Um, Remind. It's, a, it's like a... So I don't actually know whose phone numbers. Remind does. And so that way there's any non-appropriate other similar stuff that has happened, sadly, for teachers and students that's not cool. So it's all done through a system. But I could text my students, hey, you didn't seem like you were completely all... I did that times, and the students basically said, thanks for checking in. I was having a hard day. So those are the kinds of things, you know, if things kind of get out of control, find a way to have a chat with them. Mm -hmm. We also have office hours. So if I had students who are struggling, I'd call them into office hours. I'd say, hey, can, can I meet with you this afternoon at 1 o'clock or something like that? All of our synchronous time were in the mornings, and then we had office hours in the afternoon. Can I, can I check in with you? One o'clock. Can you can you come to my my room? Right, uh, you know, Zoom room. It was always the same number of room or whatever, so they knew how to get. So mm. Those are the kinds of things. So, and I was always there at one o'clock. Right. Yeah. Five so specific yeah. students. Uh -huh. So that's interesting because you have put all your uh, synchronous classes in the morning and your afternoon sessions are your office time and your asynchronous time. So there's a balance there. You know. It's Continuously going, um, you know, synchronous classes, and think, yeah, that's a good tip there. Yeah. Okay, all right. That's how our school organized it. It wasn't my decision, but I did like the model where I saw my students for maybe two, I think, yeah, two to two and a half hours of synchronously, and then the rest were normally I had five hours, and then so we cut that time in half, and then we had time afternoons or office hours, but I would specifically invite students to that who needed for help, or who just wanted extra help. I also saw, that was also when I, so I, uh, let me talk about the t testing problems. So how do you test that they don't cheat on? So here was my solution for what it's worth. Uh, I, I don't think it was 100%, but now, this may not in Malaysia, but this is what I did. My students are all given a laptop. It's part of the, the school gives every student a laptop. So they have a laptop, and all of my students have a phone. So I had them log into the Zoom room on their phone, point their phone right, at the screen. The tests were now open, open notes, but I didn't want the open internet. And then the software program that I used, the learning management system that I had, was desired to learn. Awesome um, it, I gave the tests and I had them all together in one class, one of those synchronous. And that's how I did the test. I'm also doing mastery so that if they didn't score more than 80%, I made them take it again. And then they had to come in the afternoon during the off hours to retake it. And they had to log in on their phone. And I recorded the session and I could see what was on their screen. Did some find a way to cheat? Did they have a third device with an iPad on the corner? I don't know. I mean, there's probably a way. By and large, I think it really solved most of the... I don't really think any of them cheated. Again, part of it, too, is I know these students. Okay. Um, we still have time to have another more minute. How long is the best recommended time for each online club session? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, it's going to be dependent on what you do. I, mean, I don't think that... Like I said, we had half hours a week synchronously with our students. But that's not the ideal. What the ideal is. And the ideal is five hours a week with my students. <laughs> face to face. Okay, so, at but my you gave us this half. Uh, so I think that's something a bit we can start up. So uh, half uh, of the pre-COVID period and then uh, they try to work on what's best. Uh, I, I think ultimately, so much is going to depend upon the physical space and how many, how many, how many spaces you can have with social distancing. It's going to be a function that is going to be on the control of us as educators. It's going to be decided by the leadership, by the health officials, and those are the things. And we'll just have to figure out how to make it work. I anticipate when I get to school. Students won't come to school. In fact, I know some can't because they are immunocompromised. So they, they shouldn't be at school. Yeah. So we're going to have less students next year coming physically to the class. So we're going to have to have sort of a hybrid. Some students will 
come to school. Maybe half the students. I, I, who knows how it's going to look? There are there are so many models floating out there right now that we can make this work. You could have half the students maybe come in class. I think in a conversation I had with a professor yesterday in the United States, and he says our rooms are designed for thirty five, but with social distancing, distancing, uh, we we can only have fifteen. So if we put 15 in the room on one day and then 15 on the next, but then they could work with a partner online, back and forth. I mean, there's different models. Who knows what, again, they're going to look like. There's so, again, health officials and leadership are going to have to sort of make that decision. I, I, I'm just trying to help people prepare for whatever the situation is. So wherever you are in that graph, you know you've got to provide more or less support depending on where the independent space that uh, so one last question. Basically, there are two types of students, the active and the passive in each class. How to tackle students, uh, you know, those, the passive students to get involved and how to control the active ones and, you know, how to strike a balance between the active and the passive in the class? Well, I would again say relationships, relationships. build a relationship with especially your passive students and uh, they'll become less. But there still will be some who will be passive, I get it. One thing I have found that if you force uh, them to work together, uh, you're in a breakout room, you must do this, you have a task to do, then they can't just hide. So if you've got, you know, I don't know how many students are in your classes, 30 or whatever we've got in the States, you, if you have a breakout room and you're in a room with three other people, it's hard to hide. They have a task to force them to uh, do stuff together, if that makes sense. So whatever that looks like, uh, that's a way to get passive students active. Because again, if all you're doing is lecturing, they're all going to be passive. You're bringing yeah. in an online synchronous room, folks, they're all going to be passive. Three yeah. students who raise their hands, so to speak, whatever that looks like in a WebEx room. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't do that. Just don't, don't, don't do that. you got so, in a COVID world, you have so little time, and it's so precious. Okay. And in a Zoom room or whatever room you're in, you've got to figure out how to make that valuable and engaging. And there are so many answers to that question. Um, it's getting them to do something. I mean, like the meter thing that I did, they can all vote in there. I mean, those things, and there's other tools that you can use. That I became a huge fan of is called goformative.com, where I can look over their shoulders and watch them writing and typing and doing math problems, and I would comment and say, no, 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 you're, not, you're going down the wrong track, Joe, let's talk. Uh, those kind of things that, yeah, make your group space active if you have any of it. You can do this. I know you can do it. Okay. So, uh, John, uh, I think um, we have covered all our questions. Uh, is there anything else uh, I want to cover just before? Uh, oh, let's wrap up. Yeah. 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 Well, I know this has been hard for you. I know that moving into this, this pandemic education world has been hard. And I know that you're probably exhausted. I know I have been. And like this week, I've tried to stop thinking. Like today, I hardly did anything, and it was the best thing I did. <gasps> Sometimes you see that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And I know that you are probably there. Maybe you've got this week, you're going to be learning with Uma and her team, which is awesome. But if I could just give advice, take a week and stop, rest, and be thankful. It's going to be hard next year. It may be harder than it. But also, you know, what we just did wasn't really online teaching. It was. But it was really emergency teaching. Right? And, but I think we need to up our game when it comes to our next term because now we have some time to plan and prepare. So I guess my two pieces of advice would be give yourself a break, take a week, be with your family, binge watch something, I don't know, whatever, and then start planning. What is it going to, and we don't need, you're not going to know what it's going to look like. If you get trained on how to do the basics, uh, well, then you'll be ready for whatever happens. Whether you're at a all synchronous and and Malaysia doesn't have any COVID and you guys the curve that it's all flattened and you're good, that'd be awesome. But maybe not. So 
if you get well trained, you'll be prepared for whatever, and you'll be a much better engineer. Thank you, uh, thank you, John. Uh, a wonderful session. Uh, running out of time, unfortunately. I would like to thank you again for providing your first-hand experience of dealing with this um, post-COVID, uh, this COVID uh, pandemic season. And this concludes our presentation for today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, and good night, John. It's already uh, 9 p.m. for you. It's 10 a.m. here. So thank you everyone for, uh, for participating. So John, I'll see you in a bit. Yeah, we can wrap up. So bye everyone. See you John. Thank you so much. I email you about the other thing. So. Okay. Sure.